I had a near-death experience in 1987, and it changed my life completely. I was in the height of my career uh, as a freelance image consultant with CBS News in the news division. We were wrapping up on a party, a television series party, on November the 11th, 1987. I was a guest of a female celebrity, and we were celebrating my birthday as well as a wrap party. And that night I became very ill. I began to have stomach cramps, and I began to bleed. I had been diagnosed uh, with what they thought was a stomach ulcer several months ahead of time, and I let something very simple go by refusing to take the medications, and consequently, I began to lose weight. I had lesions on my face, on my, on my uh, throat, and my neck, and my torso, and while I was in the restroom, I kind of doubled over in pain and hit the sink. Uh, I excused myself, drove myself home, and when I got to my front door, I collapsed, and I was bleeding on my carpet, on my suit. Uh, apparently, I didn't know at the time that uh, my intestinal tract had burst inside, and they had diagnosed me as ulcerative colitis. I called a friend once I got up, and they rushed me to the emergency room, and they refused to check me in because they thought I had AIDS. And back in the middle of the 80s, or the latter part of the 80s, there was so much negative media hype on the AIDS epidemic that many people who were dying of AIDS or coming into the hospitals were turned away, myself included. I was pushed in a corner, left to die. I don't could tell you how long I was there, maybe an hour, before someone discovered me, a wonderful nurse who became my savior that night, and it was she who rushed me to the OR. She made sure that the doctors took care of me. Of course, by the time I got into the OR, uh, I had lost so much blood for the last six months that um, they couldn't keep the IVs in me. My veins kept bursting, and uh, as I began to, to fade in and out of consciousness, I began to see the first tunnel while I was on the operating table. And I could see this tunnel spinning, rotating. I call it the bullseye. I didn't know what was happening. I, I didn't know why I was seeing this, and it seemed so real. I watched the doctors in slow motion go to medical protocol. They turned me over on my side and tried to hook the IV up into part of my, uh, a lower part of my back. And that's when I went out. I remember as I was fading into, I guess, a black tunnel, it was though I was in a room full of light and color and all of a sudden there was a snap and it was just a black line and then I looked around the room and me in spirit form if you will was looking down at Peter Anthony me looking at me but from above and I could see the doctors and the nurses and the anesthesiologists going to medical protocol and I remember looking at that and feeling what is going on but at the same time not questioning anything because everything was so surreal and I also felt as though something was attached to my solar plexus and as though I was being vacuumed into this tunnel. I could see people that I recognized, relatives and friends and family that had, were greeting me at this tunnel. And I remember seeing my third grade teacher, Mrs. Bellamy, but not the Mrs. Bellamy that I knew in school, but a younger version of Mrs. Bellamy, someone very happy and someone trim, someone pretty as opposed to this woman that I remember in school as being frumpy probably, it seemed like something happened in her life that she just lost that zest for life. It was though she was just on a pause moment going through life. And that's what I remember seeing her, but here was this young woman full of life and energy and, and she greeted me. And then I remember I was spinning in this rotating tunnel. I began to see mathematical equations. 222, 333, 444, 1111. I began to see all these quantum physics codes, geometry, you know, physics. And at that moment, as I'm spinning as a spirit into this tunnel, I'm digesting every mathematical code. I knew exactly what it meant. And me, being an artist, very right brain, was operating on a left brain consciousness digesting and absorbing and knowing all these mathematical equations and what they meant. Once I got through the tunnel, I ended up in this tree. I don't even know where to begin to describe this tree, but I was sitting in this tree and I was greeted by, I call it an ascended master or, or an angel, if you will, or uh, an entity or a being that was advanced. You know, being agnostic at the time, I didn't believe that there were angels. I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in you live, you die, you work, you get a family, you buy a home, and that's it. There was no interpretation, there was no alertness to religion. I just denied it, if you will. But I just didn't believe in the 
God that I had been taught. And so there I'm sitting on this tree in a stratosphere before me was my life review. It began from the time I was born in a hospital until the time I died. And I watched everything in my life, moments that you forget about, moments that you driving around and, and you acknowledge someone across in the street or you see a child at, at a park. And every moment of my life had been recorded like a matrix. It was like everything was showing simultaneously of everything, every conversation, every person, every situation, every encounter, every moment that no one thought, you know, or when we, we go back to those moments, we, we think no one's watching. Everything recorded. And I remember in high school, my sister was sharing a locker next to me, and it was my birthday. And my sister and I were very close, and all my football buddies were around me, and she was saying, aren't you going to say how much you love me and how much you care for me? I'm your best friend. And I'm watching this moment, embarrassed because she's doing all this in front of my friends. And I'm watching this as though not in a, in a, in a perspective of judgment and sadness, but awareness. Watching my sister say all these things and I could hear my thoughts in my head, watching this moment in my life saying, just go away, my, my friends are watching. And I didn't say anything and I walked away. That was the night my sister was killed by a drunk driver. What I learned was those moments when we go through life that we don't share with people, how much we love them, how much we care for them. The moment for me as I looked down, there was no judgment. Just like, you know, this angel, if you will, see what you did. There wasn't any of that. What was there was in my heart, you could have done better, Peter. My sister and I were left in an orphanage, and uh, you know, when you have a, a bond with the only family member that you remember, when I lost her, it was tough. And these moments kept occurring where you would see your life that you look down, again, no judgment, but an observation with kindness and compassion and understanding for, for yourself of everything that we do that we think we're not being watched, it's our life. Those moments that we can shine as individuals, every moment of our life are recorded. I didn't murder anyone, I didn't uh, you know, rob a store, I wasn't vile to people, but what I did see, as I said, were these moments where I could have shined, where I could have helped someone that needed help. I remember driving I was being interviewed for CBS, and it was, this is my sixth and final interview, and I thought I had it in the bag, and you know, rather cocky. And I'm driving across this bridge, and I have my windows down, and music is playing loud, and I pull up some gum and take it off the wrapper and put it in my mouth, and I flick the wrapper and the paper off the bridge, and I watch this wrapper just going down this river, and this wrapper is met by trash. I'm seeing needles, I'm seeing cat litter, I'm seeing all kinds of debris trash meeting trash and I watched this wrapper go down this river into a lake and the lake went off into another river and it went down the river past these oil refineries and all the toxic waste that were coming out of this factory this oil refinery were meeting other waste and what I saw were children swimming in the river and the lakes I guess I was forwarded to a, a moment in my life where I could see these children that had died due to the toxic waste and the doctors having no idea what happened, yet the oil companies and the oil refineries, they did. I saw the pharmaceutical companies turning their, their faces in another direction. It made me realize that my one wrapper affects everyone. And so it made me, when I came back, more environmentally aware. To this day, I try to do things that basically you know, are more positive to the environment. And again, I, I say this because my life review was about everything and nothing. How each moment that we live on this life is a moment of, of value, and we kind of forget that. So I went to this place called Bordeaux. And there was a cleansing, I called it the cleansing station, and I got a chance to look around, if you will, a, a much larger stratosphere. I was in this galaxy looking down at Mother Earth and looking at the stars and other planets, but it was though I had a zoom lens. And I could zero into different parts of the world. I could see the massacre in the dolphin. I could see governments all around the world. 
we've given our power away to, to leaders who basically abuse that power. And we were so eager to give that power to people who were so eager to use it against us. And you're watching this, and again, no judgment. You're not looking down and going, oh, what a horrible human being you are, what a horrible leader you are. But what you're seeing from your perspective is, wow, what can I do to contribute? I'm having this conversation with what I call God. But it wasn't the man in the beard and the white cloak and the staff. and but It was an entity surrounded by gold fragments of life. You know, imagine a fire going out on the ambers, the gold ambers, just are floating all around you, but multiply that by 10 times. This, this fragment of energy was going through me. It came from my solar, in the back, and went out through my solar plexus, and I could feel this kindness and compassion and love that, how do you describe it? I mean, if you have a dog, you know how much you love your dog. If you have a girlfriend, you know how much you love your girlfriend. Multiply that 10 times 10 times 10. It's not suffice. That's how much love you feel. For me, this was a, a turning point in my life because I realized that we as a, as a people, we have a lot of anger. I could see, as I said, I mean, I was just the massacre of the animal kingdom, but what we did to our Mother Earth and, and war, I mean, I saw so much war going on. We are a warring planet. And based on what? Someone's ego, someone's abuse of power. So as I looked at this planet that we call Earth, I was given a choice to go back. Do you want to go back? The voice said. And I could look at all this anger on our planet, the warring nations, but I also got a chance to see teachers and firemen and policemen and, and neighbors and strangers doing such kind deeds. I also got a chance to see my life ahead. I saw myself speaking to scores of people at lectures. I saw myself writing books. Uh, I saw myself traveling around the world talking about my near-death experience. I also saw my two-year recovery and I knew the challenges ahead. The psychiatrist and I also saw my attempted suicide. All these things I saw ahead and the voice, do you want to go back? And I said yes. And I remember all around me were these fragments of energy and color and, and I remember being in this sphere of light, if you will, going back, and I remember the moment I hit my physical body. I remember that I woke up, apparently I was unconscious for three and a half weeks, and when I woke up, there were Christmas decorations in the hospital. When I went into the hospital on November the 11th, there was nothing, so it was this kind of reality check of, oh my God, this time had lapsed, what happened? But something occurred on the other side, and so many people always say, oh, it's just a dream, or you hallucinated, or so many of these things they say are not real. You and your heart know what you saw on the other side. You know what you felt on the other side. And while I was going down the hallway in the hospital and watching people go in and out of this hospital, certainly on a very difficult night, not only for myself, but for other patients who were coming in, there was a friend of mine who showed up, and I remember passing her, this me, Peter, the spirit form, passing her, and as she as I passed her, she said, Peter Anthony, it's not your time to go. And I remember that moment, and so when she came into the room, I shared that with her. And she looked at me as though, how did you know that? I also came back with this knowledge of my disease, and that the medications that they were giving me were causing harmful effects to my physical body. So I would have these conversations with the doctor about the antibiotics and the the cortisones and the steroids they were putting in my body and and they wouldn't listen to me. They kept feeding my body with all these harsh chemicals. I lost my vision, I couldn't walk. The staph infection appeared out of nowhere and stayed on my face and just basically crawled from cheek up to, to ear. They couldn't cure it. I had these adverse reactions, inexplicable reactions to all the medications they were giving me. And the doctors couldn't explain it. They couldn't explain why I had lost my vision. They couldn't explain why I couldn't walk. I knew. And so what I did, I told my friend, the woman I, that came to stay with me and, and throughout this horrible hospital experience, and I asked for certain vitamins. I asked for acidophilus. I asked for pure garlic. I asked for certain herbs. And she would go off to the vitamin stores and find these herbs and vitamins and bring them back to me. And, and I began to take these herbs because I knew I had to. 
and I began to wean myself off the, the medications that the doctors were giving me. And it was that that helped save my life. So for me, the challenges medically were tough, but the most difficult part, the people who didn't listen to me, who didn't believe me. I came back, as I said, you know, not stuttering, but I came back talking about what happened to me on the other side. I just couldn't share my story enough with people and they look at you like you're a nutcase. And you know, I could hear the nurses' thoughts in their head, oh my God, this guy is a whack job. You know, and they would look at my frail body and everyone had given up hope on me. <laughs> Not me, I knew what I had to do. I knew I had to write books. I knew I had to travel. I knew I had to, to do lectures and talk about my near-death experience, but people just didn't care. I remember uh, one day the doctor came in and said to me, Mr. Anthony, unfortunately I have some bad news for you. We're gonna have to do another surgery. I knew that if I went in for another surgery, that was it. And so I said, I, I, I refused the surgery. They also wanted to do um, radiation treatment. And if that didn't work, they would do chemo. And I knew if I had chemo or did radiation treatment, I was a goner, so I refused. Uh, and they told me that if I didn't do this, I had less than three months to live. I remember <laughs> months later, when I was being checked out. It's not that I walked, but friends helped me, and I hobbled to that elevator, down that hallway, down to the elevator, and I turned around to that doctor and said, I'm walking. And that was the moment that I knew that life began for me, walking down that hospital corridor, because I was determined that no one else's opinion was gonna matter more than my own. I went back to see that doctor, and he called me his miracle patient, stunned by my recovery, stunned by you know what I was doing in terms of my own recovery. I guess the saddest part of, of recovery are the people who, who didn't believe. The friends that disappeared, what little bit of family I did have left, still to this day doesn't talk to me. There's a lot of suicide with near-death experiencers. They can't deal with the information that we've been given. I have a, a dear friend of mine who had a near-death experience and her husband is the deacon of a Baptist church. She's talked about her near-death experience. She's forbidden to talk about it. Her husband basically is not kind to her, and she's brilliant. And she sits in this world of religion, if you will, and they don't believe her. So it's tough, it's tough for many of us. I have many people who have passed and have come back uh, who are experiencers who have a really tough time dealing with what we call the real world because you come back hypersensitive and you look at life differently. You know, I, I lost my vision. Every morning I get up, I take a gratitude walk and I look around all this beauty and I know I've been given a second chance. So I don't take what I see for granted. Add the fact that I was in a wheelchair for quite some time, I couldn't walk. When I walk to this day, I'm grateful. We take for granted that we're given a day. Your, your day could end this afternoon.